Wow, David, thank you. Um, great to be with you all. I know it's uh, the, the, the break after lunch. So this is, uh, I know, the very envied uh, opportunity to speak. So I appreciate our, our speakers, our panelists that are going to be here. Um, but thank you, David, again. Thank you to Corporate Travel uh, for hosting this, uh, this great Good News Conference. Um, just a little bit about Legatus. Um, Legatus uh, was founded by Tom Monahan, who, who David mentioned, the founder of Domino's Pizza, uh, amongst Ave Maria University, Ave Maria School of Law, Thomas More Law Center, the Dominican Sisters of Mary Mother of the Eucharist, Ave Maria Radio, and so on. So, um, and Legatus. Uh, so he founded Legatus in 1987 for presidents and CEOs. He was the, obviously the CEO of Domino's Pizza, and he wanted an organization that would bring together proven leaders that had in common their faith and leaders that were committed to learning more about their faith and then living it in all aspects and spheres of their life. Uh, so that's what he did in 1987, modeled after uh, YPO, Young President's Organization. Uh, and so we now have about 90 chapters across North America, continuing to grow um, and, and serving, serving our members uh, across uh, the US and Canada. So thank you for being here. If you wanna learn more information about Legatus, legatus.org, or we have a booth out there um, but I, I want to get into really what our panel is going to talk about today, and that's the intersection of faith and business. Um, so I would like to just briefly introduce our speakers. We're going to get a little bit more uh, into their bios. All, of, all three of them uh, just happen to be Legatus members uh, from across um, the United States. Um, so first we've got Chris McMahon. Chris is the, the founder and CEO of MFA Wealth out of Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, he's been in that role for about 30 years. He recently embarked upon founding a new Catholic organization called Aquinas Wealth, which is also exhibiting out here in the, in the foyer. Um, Chris, tell us a little bit more about your background and, and how you um, don't live a divided life, how you incorporate your faith, not just uh, at home on the, on, in the evenings and on the weekends, but also in your business. Thanks, Stephen. So Stephen does do an incredibly good job at being president of Legatus. You know, imagine herding cats, right? Uh, everybody's a, a, a chief and nobody wants to be an Indian, but Stephen does a fabulous job. And Legatus has changed our life. So Ma and I have five children. They're grown. They all live in New York City. We're in Pittsburgh. We met. We've been married 35 years. And um, for many years of financial services life, many of the folks in the room may have been in financial services. It was thought to be uh, siloed. You sh weren't supposed to Bring your faith. Don't bring. Don't discuss politics or faith with anyone because you'll lose business. Was the concept, and that was okay early on because guess what? There was no uh, corporations weren't taking incredibly progressive leftist views. They weren't active. Companies would make profits. They'd return them to shareholders in the form of dividends, and then the, the shareholders would decide what to do with it. About 10 years ago, we noticed that all the our, our clients, our friends, as we started to live a more undivided life, we made a decision to live an undivided life and integrate things. Our friends were saying, what are we supporting here? My goodness, are we supporting Planned Parenthood, radical transgender ideology, pornography? How do I sort this out? And there's some great Catholic mutual funds. But we said there's not enough. We need to give people the tools so they can dissect everything that they have and then move to a more faith-aligned a faith-aligned um, system. So that's what we did, and it's been working out wonderfully. There's four quick steps, I think, to living that undivided life. I always ask, my friends always ask me what they are. One is put a crucifix on your desk, because people stop telling you dirty jokes and being raunchy with you. If you don't have a desk, please put it on your screensaver. Simple. Two, put together a, a group at your church. Put together a group of men at your church or women at your church. Read the um, Litany of Humility or and any other prayer after Mass. The, pair, the priest will love to come down and spend time with you. We now have 35, 40 guys in Pittsburgh that get together after Mass. We call it Catholic Bromentum. You could call it what you want. You could, you could call it that if you like, right, which I think is very important. Three, live with joy. I'm so exhausted by Catholics saying, you know, only 27% believe in the actual presence. I'm like, shut up and say something positive, right? Tell them why they should believe in the real presence. Live with joy, engage. And I don't remember what four is right now, so Stephen, I'll turn it back to you. You're gonna tell us how you really feel. Um, thanks, Chris. Uh, our next panelist, uh, Tim Patton. Tim is, uh, his background is in the um, healthcare industry. And uh, Tim has been a member of Legatus for about 20 years. He's married to uh, Shan. Um, Tim, I'm gonna ask you the same question. Um, 
how do you how do you not live a divided life, and how do you bring it, especially in the healthcare industry, which is. Um, and, and I'm going to get into this a bit with Alan, but you know where a lot of these lawsuits come about uh, with whether it be the pro-life issues or the gender issues, et cetera. Tell us a little bit about your background and, and how you live that um, unified life as a Catholic. <clears throat> Thank you for including me. Uh, we're, we're fortunate that uh, in our series of companies we've built over the years that <clears throat> almost all the senior leadership is Catholic, so quite unified in that regard. And so it's able, we're able to set the tone. And so it starts with any major meeting that we have with employees or with our business partners, we start with prayer. And um, unusually and unexpectedly, we've never had anybody oppose it. We've had venture capital, we've had investment bankers, we've had suppliers. And when you ask if it's okay, we pray before we have a meeting, never anybody. They may not be practicing any faith, but they're always willing and accepting of it. And I've gotten some beautiful notes as a result. So we always pray before major meetings. Uh, I merged the company seven years ago with a wonderful Catholic woman, great leader. And together, we pledged that we'd been very fortunate in life and that we wanted to attempt to give 50% of our annual profits to charity. And we let the employees know that was the case. And then, some of you may know Father John Ricardo from the Archdiocese of Detroit. Uh, I had the good fortune to meet his father one time, and I heard legendary things. And most of you may not know this about Father John, but his father, John Ricardo Sr., was the CEO of Chrysler, once removed from Lee Iacocca. And as he traveled the world on behalf of Chrysler's business and met ambassadors and dignitaries, heads of state, venture partners in countries all over the world, his advance team knew that when you plan my schedule, I don't care if it's China, it's Mexico, it's wherever, there'll be a Catholic mass there, and you make sure that that's on my itinerary for the day, and we don't miss Catholic mass. And the trickle-down effect of that within Chrysler was tremendous, knowing that's the kind of leader they have. So we try to do in a small way, the same thing, which is that when we have our, we're scattered all over the country, but when we do get together at the home office for a meeting like once a quarter, that before we uh, start the meeting, we uh, go to church. And that resonates within the community. So those are the few things we're doing. I think we're gonna have further yeah, questions. That's great, yeah, thanks Tim. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Alan Sears. Alan built Alliance Defending Freedom um, to become the, the largest civil liberties law firm in the world. He's a member of our Phoenix chapter with his wife, Paula. Um, Alan, the same question goes to you. Um, uh, you know, working with lawyers, which, uh, boy, do I love working for lawyers, too. Um, that would be my first advice, don't work for a lawyer. No, uh, but, um, yeah. Alan, tell us a little bit how, of how you, uh, building Alliance Defending Freedom into, into the powerhouse that it is today, defending civil rights across the world, um, how you integrate that faith, because you cross a lot of um, barriers, not just Christianity, but you have a lot of folks defending uh, Muslim, Jews, Catholics, Christians, etc. So how do you live that? Well, I think there are three or four key words, and the first word I would use is relationships. You know, everybody uh, wants to be recognized as a child of God. Whatever their background, no matter how crude they may be, no matter how much uh, they oppose. In fact, one of our mantras at, at Alliance Defending Freedom is we don't have enemies. There's only one enemy. We have opponents. And we, uh, our rule was we want to treat everyone on both sides of this battle in such a way that they would feel welcome to be at the communion rail with us next Sunday. And uh, I think that probably uh, was one of the top things that we said. we said. We said another thing. If we have success, and all success comes from God, our theme verse, John 15, 5, it's my life theme verse, as well as our apostolate theme verse, without Christ we can do nothing. We said we want to always acknowledge that any accomplishment, any good, is from God. It's not by our hand. We work hard, we focus, we apply every resource we can, but at the end of the day, all credit for every accomplishment 
goes to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, and, and part of this, we adopted a mantra called making stars of others. Whenever there's an opportunity uh, to lift others up, and of course, you know, when you engage in building an apostolate, I'd say first of all, building an apostolate may be more difficult than a secular business sometimes to keep it Christian. Uh, if anybody wants to know what I mean by that, you can ask me in the Q&A period. But there's just so many squabbles and there's so many things the devil brings to attack you. But I said, let's look, for example, uh, for a period of time, I said, in every press release, put our allies' names ahead of our name. Mm -hmm. Lift them up. Show them their value. And uh, God will take care of us. And, you know, of course, I've got staff who say, well, we, we've got to raise money. We've got to get funding. And if you give these people credit, uh, you know, they'll give money to... Uh, uh, to uh, th that group instead of our, your group. And I said, well, so what? And one of the things we did to further this, we created a grant program to give money to our, to our allies, many of whom the world would call our competitors. And God blessed us to give over $42 million in, a, in over 1,400 grants to those that the world would call our competitors to make, to make stars of others. It's, uh, it's all grace. But uh, I would say, Steve, very important thing. We were very blessed. Uh, Paul and I were one of the co-founding couples, as you know, to found the Phoenix chapter of Legatus. Uh, we found a great fellowship there. Uh, one of the things about being a CEO is that uh, you're alone. And all of you in this room who've been CEOs or have been leaders in different positions know that uh, you can't share with your spouse some of the most difficult things you're going through. You can't share with uh, family members, and you can't even share with your senior team. And you certainly can't share with most of the priests. They're already overwhelmed, and you go in, and they say, Alan, you know, please, don't, don't, you know, don't put all this on me. And, uh, you know, and, and these are guys you love. But, but Legatus is a place where uh, men and women who are in leadership can find peers who you can share those kind of heart breaks those kind of difficulties so again back to my first word relationships and uh, Steve thanks for leading the goddess and for all of you that have been part of it uh, I think you would have uh, a similar experience with me so those thank, are a thank few you thoughts. and I misspoke I, what I meant to say is never work for a bad lawyer and obviously yeah. uh, Alliance Defending Freedom is <laughs> if you've come across their lawyers and uh, I was just recently internationally with, uh, they have a, a group internationally uh, of, of business folks, not just lawyers, and it's an amazing organization, so thank you, Alan. Um, you know, as a backdrop, and I guess a, a little homework for you all, um, if you have not read the document uh, called The Vocation of the Business Leader, uh, I would encourage you to Google that, to look it up. Um, again, it's called The Vocation of the Business Leader, but I wanted to just mention a little excerpt, because it's something that... Uh, we as an organization really keep at the forefront um, and that I would encourage you, and it gives you practical ways and questions to ask whether you're at the top of the organization or the bottom of the organization, how an organization really should, should live out its Catholic identity. Um, but it was written by the Dicastery uh, for Promoting Integral Human Development back in 2010 and it was associated with uh, the University of St. Thomas uh, in Minnesota. Uh, but this little excerpt I just wanted to share. Uh, the vocation of the business person is a genuine human in a Christian calling. Pope Francis calls it a noble vocation, provided that those engaged in it see themselves challenged by a greater meaning in life. This will enable them truly to serve the common good by striving to increase the goods of the world and to make them more accessible to all. Chris, I'd like to go back to you. Um, you know, investments are something that... Um, are just wrought with woke ideologies everywhere you look. And I think one of the, at least my question, and I'm sure a lot of the folks here want to know, you know, when, when you're surrounded by it, how do you support Catholic entities and organizations not marred by all the other uh, woke things? And it's hard to get away from it. I mean, all of us have cell phones and computers and, and you know, shop at Target or go to Starbucks, whatever. How do you align with that from an investment standpoint? And I think just like some of us have made the decision not to shop at certain stores until they realign themselves, I think that's a reasonable thing to do. Talk with our, certainly our checkbooks. And I think we have to do it as investment people as well. You know, there's a scoring system many people don't know about. It's called a CEI score. It's a um, corporate 
Equality Index. It seems to make sense on its face. Many of these policies have been born in compassion. They're, they're born out of compassion, right? But they've just been so uh, mutated that, that you don't recognize them. A few months back, I was in New York, and I was in a, uh, there was a debate, and there was ESG investing versus morals, excuse me, Catholic value investing. As you can imagine, I was on the Catholic value side, and the young guy from the other side was, you know, from State Street, a big investment firm. And you know, State Street, BlackRock, Vanguard, these are huge investment firms, but the reality is they've been driving this ESG agenda uh, incredibly. The chairman a couple years ago of BlackRock said very clearly, unless to, they, remember they hold about 30% of the S&P 500. He said to the chairman of these companies, unless you embrace our ideology around gender identity, regardless of your profitability of your company, your job will be impacted. How do they, how do they decide if a company is meeting their ideology? There's a CEI score that none, most, most of us have never heard of. The CEI score, I, I'd like you to Google it if you get a chance. It's five, there's five uh, elements of scoring, equality, hiring, et cetera. One of them, literally, they'll take points away from you if you support any organization they deem not to be friendly to the LGBTQ community. Of course we're all we're created by God. Of course we're entitled to his dignity, of course. But the concept that the Catholic Church, if you support Catholic charities, what that means is, if you support Catholic charities, your score will be lower, therefore you will not be bought in that mutual fund or the, the leadership of the company will be brought, moved over. In this debate, this young man said with a straight face, I got into ESG investing because of my faith. I said, that's good. Now I think it's important you get out of it, right? Because it's a terrible, terrible situation where this, this concept of equality, which is a beautiful and, 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 and seeped in our Catholic faith, has been, has been, uh, has been uh, really taken over. But the good, great news is there's hope. There's technology now that's available. Everyone can go online, look at these companies, and something very powerful. We've made a huge mistake. We've, we, we, remember when we walked by those displays, we just said, oh, that, that, that's, that'll be gone tomorrow. The, the bathing suits for the transgender bathing suits, we won't say anything. The good news is the, 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 the more conservative folks have started saying something, but all of us have a responsibility to go to our investment professionals and say, I need you, show me the technology you use to show me that I'm not supporting these things. Unfortunately, many, many of these companies, the actual brokerage companies, support them themselves, right? But what we have to do is every time we, all of us, every time we move an investment, we have to write a letter to that company or have our advisor write a letter saying, we, we had to sell this stock because this is the position you made. We have the power, I'm very optimistic, and we're, together we're gonna change the world, which I'm excited about. Thank you. Again, if you wanna have more conversation on the investment side, obviously, Chris has his booth out there. You've got Ave Marie Mutual Funds, the Knights of Columbus have, have their donor advised funds as well. Um, there's a lot of good opportunities for Catholics to make sure you're aligned. Uh, Tim, I, I want to um, dive in a little bit into this concept that I think for us in Legatus is a sweet spot uh, for members, and that's this concept of halftime. Moving from success to significance. So you've lived your life making a living for your family, and now you want to leave an impact uh, and, and leave a legacy for your family. Um, Tell us what, what that means to you, if you could, and then what have you done to, to further impact uh, those in your, your spheres? Yeah, th thank you, very personal to me, loud. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm one of about 16, I think, from Legatus that have gone through the halftime program now, which is a year-long uh, program with, with peers that have had, in some sense, a good first half their families are intact, their health is in pretty good shape, and they have some financial resources that most people don't. So according to Ephesians 2.10, what is it that God puts you on this earth with a purpose in mind? We have to help you at halftime find what that is and then surround you with all the resources and help for you to implement a plan to fulfill that Ephesians 2.10 calling. Uh, fortunately, I, I was the first one from La Goddess to go through it about nine years ago. And then uh, Tom Monahan went through it. He was, he, the, the age group generally, there's been a few people in their 30s. Most of them are 50s, early 60s. But Tom went through it, I think, at 81 years old. So he was definitely the, the chairman of the board. Uh, but it, it's, it's helped uh, to us and, and my wife, Shannon, and I to try to identify where we can put our resources and talents to work. And we've tried to concentrate on the intersection of the pro-life movement alongside a Catholic primary health care specialty, 
practice that we're trying to help become a national model for pediatrics, OBGYN, family practice, and also mental health because there's such an abundance of mental health problems. So that's kind of where we've applied our resources and, and uh, so far, slow start over the last few years, but we feel like there's a consensus coming together on a national basis that we can roll something out that will become the standard for Catholic health care uh, in the country. Thanks, Tim. Uh, I have to mention, Tim's making a big sacrifice to be here. Uh, at 12 noon was the kickoff for the University of Michigan football team. <laughs> um, and, and you might have heard about a year ago, uh, Jim Harbaugh made a statement that, that made news. Tim, you can just share a little bit about that statement at, at the uh, Pro-Life Arbor Women uh, event that, that you helped fund and, and just the, the, the ripple effect that it had throughout the pro-life movement, but uh, across Ann Arbor. I mean, it was... Uh, whatever you think of Jim Harbaugh, you're probably wrong. Um, he is an incredible family man, uh, an incredibly faithful Catholic. He actually went to grade school at the same school that our kids all went through. Um, and we've had enough time to spend with he and his wonderful wife, Sarah, who's one of 13 kids, is she? And she's walked the line with her mother at Planned Parenthood since she was a teenager. And it's a very pro-life family, and they're unabashed, and they're not afraid to get criticized. Well, you probably picked it up by now, he's not afraid to get criticized. <laughs> so uh, a couple of years back, he'd already been, we, we had Coach John Beeline, the basketball coach, who for 10 years gave his time and raised a fortune for Shan's organization. And then he retired, and we needed to find, how do you figure to fill that slot of a celebrity that would have that kind of draw? And everybody knew that Harbaugh was Catholic, but no one knew him. They said, does anybody have a connection to Jim Harbaugh? And they all looked at my wife because she was in the same Bible study with Jim's wife. Anyway, he agreed to give uh, these dinners. And the, the first time we did one, um, I was warned by the restaurant that was hosting 40 people that I had the wrong idea about Jim Harbaugh. If we thought he was going to spend two and a half or three hours like Coach Beeline had before, that we were mistaken. And they said, you know, he'll be here 30 minutes, he'll take his dinner to go, and he'll go home to his family. So we had a talk at home about how to make sure this wasn't a disaster for the donors. And, and I said, I just need to have a man-to-man -man conversation with him and, and, and write him a letter and say, this is what the precedent has been, and could you please do something similar to what Coach Beeline did? Shan, no, oh, no, no, no. I have a friendship with his wife. I don't want to ruin everything. And so she said, I, I'm going to handle it my own way. So she bought a statue of Mary and Jesus, wrote a note personally thanking them for their time, and put it on their doorstep the night before the event. They came and spent three and a half hours. <laughs> but, in, but in any event, as, that, as his uh, statements about pro-life became more evident, everybody in the, in the world wanted his time. And just trying to defend his schedule and leave him time for his own family is hard. So another organization with a much larger audience, because ours was high paying donors that could keep their mouth shut. It was their private setting. The other setting was more like 250 people. It was publicized in the press. And there were people in the press that were there and taped things. But the two most profound things that Jim said long answer to your short question, is he said, I believe in two things. One is, I believe in giving the unborn a chance to be born. Mm. And that just rocked the Planned Parenthood group. And they came, and they, the, the, the emails that came into his poor wife and the chastisement and whatever. And then he, he followed up not, not long after that saying, I've told my players and my coaches if any of you have an unwanted pregnancy before you abort a child, my wife and I will adopt. Wow, putting your money where your mouth is. That's, thank you for sharing that story. Alan, uh, obviously most corporations, if not all corporations, have lawyers in their boardroom. It, it become, it's become a very litigious uh, environment. Um, and since you've left ADF, uh, you're no longer the CEO, you have really championed a, a program to help lawyers um, form them into being not just uh, moral, morally and ethical, 
uh, but also leaders of companies, and, and you're at the forefront. I mean, you've got now uh, Supreme Court justices as well that have been involved with ADF at the, on the state level and others. Tell us a little bit about that program, uh, the Blackstone program. Yeah, there, actually, there are two programs uh, that we, we can talk about briefly. The, uh, the grandfather of these was something we launched in 2000. We called it the Blackstone Legal Fellowship. And it goes back to your very first question, Steve, because the question was, how do we teach people to live for Christ in their profession 24-7 to fully integrate? And actually, Blackstone was uh, started in my thinking when I was a law student because I had a broken heart going to law school. I went to law school with all these, uh, I call them now, false noble ideas about how wonderful I was going to be as, as a, a guy who loved God and I was going to go into law and do all these wonderful things. And I got into law school just a few months after Roe v. Wade had come down. And I've got to tell you, it was, uh, in law school, Roe v. Wade was considered something like nirvana. And uh, even in classes that had nothing to do with constitutional law, everybody was talking about, well, maybe someday contracts will be construed with the understanding of rewriting them for the, you know, and again, false compassion, uh, as you were talking about. And so this, this idea grew in my heart, and I said we need to have something that does two things. We need something, first of all, that creates fellowship because we can't live alone. We're, we're not alone. And secondly, we need something to combat because I knew all my professors that were teaching this line and talking about this fantastic new constitution that the courts were going to recreate were wrong, but I had no clue on how to combat that discussion. I didn't know about natural law, I'd never heard of it, never understood anything about it, et cetera. And so fast forward, when we launched Alliance Defending Freedom, uh, just a few years into it, in 2000, we launched what we call the Blackstone Legal Fellowship. It's a nine-week summer program. We have a Blackstone, I don't know if Rebecca's here in the room or not, but we have a Blackstone here at the conference. And the idea was, and, and Johnny Hale, Jr., is also a Blackstone fellow in his last year at Notre Dame Law. But the idea was between the first and second year of law school, bring young women and men in, train them, starting first of all with natural law, uh, which sadly to say in many Catholic law schools is nowhere on their agenda, teach them about constitutional principles. And as you mentioned, we had now Supreme Court justices, many federal judges, many federal officials teaching in our program. And we had daily mass. And, uh, uh, and, and we opened this to people of all Christian faiths that were willing to sign the Apostles' Creed. And to make a long story short, uh, God was very good to us. Uh, we said we want you know, to, this to be a lifelong relationship. The first hire we made was our alumni director before we had our first class. Before we had our first, we had 24 the first summer. We're now running about 200 every summer for the entire nine-week program. We have 2,600 Blackstone students from 220-plus law schools from 48 different countries. And, they're, and, and God's been incredible uh, to this uh, program because there, there's uh, over 100 that work for the U.S. Congress now. They're in major law firms as partners. They're on federal courts of appeal, state supreme courts, uh, on and on and on. But the idea was to teach them. The Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, uh, was, was with ADF for eight years and taught in our Blackstone program. Uh, very, very dear man. Uh, pray for him. He's under incredible attack for such things as trying to keep pornography away from his children. The other program, the Arete, is what we do in Latin America and in Europe. Uh, we have about uh, over a thousand graduates of that program. You ran into a bunch of them when you were in Europe recently. And arete is a word that's in the Greek New Testament five times, once in Philippians, first, second Peter, and it talks about excellence and virtue. And the concept of an arete life is a life lived at the fullness of what God means for you. And uh, my wife tells me I've talked enough. Uh, she always gives me that little cut signal. We, uh, no, after 30 great. some years in the ministry together, but, uh, but, but, but the essence of all of these programs was the same thing as Legatus, to, to live, to teach, uh, and to share with others yeah. around you this thing. And, and what's so beautiful, we've seen major secular law firms that 
or in everything you were talking about with ESG and all of this, who are now allowing their lawyers to represent Catholics and Christians in pro-life and other areas because we're holding them to the language of their documents that say they don't discriminate. And, so, and uh, you know, we could, long stories on many of these uh, victories that have been won, but, but there's a cadre of men and women in the law field now that are there for one purpose, and that is to honor Christ with every essence of their being. Beautiful, Beautiful. thank you. Thanks, Alan. We're going to open it up for questions. Uh, so if, if you have a question, but uh, kind of, we'll call this a quick fire, all right? Oh, quick fire. Um, your practical advice. You mentioned, you know, have a cross, whether a crucifix on your desk, whatever. Well, let's go down the line. If you have practical advice, whether you're at the top or the bottom of the of the uh, food chain in a, in a corporation. I, I can't under I can't underscore that enough. Have a crucifix or a tangible sign of God in your office on your person. That is enormously important. Seek joy is extraordinarily important. If you don't, if you're by nature maudlin, or is that the right to, if you're, you know, down in the mouth, if you're, if you're Eeyore, right? Change that, because people are looking to you, they're coming to you. If you don't know a story, Google the Sisters of Life, and you will be filled up for the rest of your life. Ask your priest, what was his story? What was his, um, his vocation story. I heard Father Chris last night, uh, we sat with a dinner in Gary, Indiana, the reopening for Catholic schools. Live with joy, articulate those things to people, and that will change the world. Hire people of faith, never compromise. Uh, I had the good fortune when I graduated from college to have dinner with the founder and CEO of a, what seemed like a big company back then, $4 billion, it's nothing today, but. Uh, and he took a bunch of young recruits out to dinner and he said, I want to tell you, you're going to be in a position of responsibility quickly. You're going to be hiring a lot of people and I, I want you to check resumes. I want you to check references over and over again. I want you to have more than one person interview somebody before you make an offer. But the final thing I want you to tell, tell yourself is before you make that hire, would you feel comfortable having that candidate home to your dinner at your own family table? And if you can't affirmatively answer yes, don't hire them. That's great advice. That's a great one. And I would say create the capacity for opportunity of faith events.